a suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one All right, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who once said A person between two lawyers is like a fish between two cats So if you'd like to be a fish, we've got the cat Ladies and gentlemen, David Whiting Back from holiday Yeah, great <laughs> Nice to come back to platitudes. Nice to come back to platitudes. Yep. You happy with that description? Yeah, I think it's reasonably fair. Yes. I don't. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin meant it as a compliment either. Unfortunately, I think most he should people, have done. Most people's descriptions of lawyers do not involve compliments. Now you don't have any homework because no. you've had a break. Did you have a good break? I did. Had a nice time. All right. It's uh, wonderful to see you. Hey, if, uh, I wanted to mention too that uh, Donald Trump is uh, is due to be speaking. At some point after, this is the first time he's talked since the second assassination attempt, uh, and if there's anything new there, we'll make sure we bring it to you. David, I wanted to ask you that we took a call from uh, Michael, who can't get building insurance for his apartment block because there is a tobacconist on the, uh, the ground floor. This is what he said. Not a single one of them were open to insuring our building. So we're now on the international market under what's known as a special risk policy, and that's tripled the cost of our insurance. We've got residents living above that shop, including families. A firebombing in in that building would be just catastrophic. We are aware, anecdotally, that there are other owners corporation bodies out there in similar positions, and what we've been told is that they just don't have insurance as a result of this. All right, there you go. Uh, so Michael uh, said he can't get insurance because they have a tobacconist at the at the bottom. The owners corporation is required to insure. So the owners corporation act essentially says that if you have a unit that's above or below another unit, and clearly in in Michael's block there will be. There is an obligation to insure. Um, I don't, so I, I certainly applaud the approach that Michael's taking, but I'd actually take a slightly different approach. I would be endeavouring to talk to the Minister because um, you may recall that some years ago there was a problem with insurers for builders. And the, what happened was the government introduced their own insurance policies for builders. So the Victorian Managed Insurance Agency started to offer insurance for builders who couldn't otherwise get insurance. It's really the same kind of argument. Okay. So uh, I'd Ma- be talking to the Minister. Michael had mentioned that they were perhaps trying to get an exemption from that. I, but an exemption simply hard- means... The exemption means I want permission to not have insurance. But the problem's going to be that every mortgagee in that building is going to be terrified, as is every owner. Would Michael have the grounds to go to the tobacconist and say, hey, listen, I'm sorry, we're, we're done, you're going to have well, to leave? Well, think of it from, there's th- kind of three players here. There's everyone else in the block. There's the person who owns the investment property that is the tobacconist and there is the person that con- conducts the tobacconist business. So my, my view would be if the tobacconist was making a, making a profit on a business that could be lawfully carried out, then, well, the other option might be to get the owners' corporation to buy the leasehold of the place downstairs. Okay. So that would that in the longer term that might be a better outcome, is that the owners' corporation uh, buys the business of the tobacconist and closes it down. It'll still have an ongoing obligation to rent on the premises till the end of the lease term. But then at that point, there would be nothing to prevent the owner of the shop downstairs putting another tobacconist in, Mm. which is a problem. You ready for some calls? Sure. Numbers 1300 222 774 if you want to talk to David. Carol is in West Meadows. Hi, Carol. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, So my... I had a, a terrible thing happen to me on the weekend and I don't know what to do um, and I have several questions. So thank you for being a venue to, to ask something. Um, I turned up at my father's house, which has been mostly vacant um, for the last you know, 12, 15 years. Wow. And my key didn't work. Um, I've been the carer of my mother for the last 12 years and was renovating the house proper prior to that. Anyway... Um, my mother passed away and I've not been to the house for probably about nine weeks 
and someone broke in, changed all the locks. They removed all of the everything, absolutely everything that was in the house, furniture, clothing, personal belongings, toiletries, everything in the kitchen, everything in the garage, all my nine volt garden tools, power tools, okay, everything. Carol, gone. your your options are you can report the matter to the who owns the property now. Uh, so I own the property for long. Okay. I rang the police. Yes. The police attended. I proved that I owned the house. I talked to my neighbours who said, yes, it's Carol's house. Um, they called a locksmith. The locksmith broke, you know, in. Yes. Um, they weren't in there, but they had moved furniture in. They'd moved the fridge in. Carol, moved the Carol I, what I would be doing would be I hiring a security lock. guard I, uh, for a period of time. Yeah. to challenge everybody who comes and visits the property. So you've retaken okay. possession. Yes, And I what have. you're doing is, uh, I would then simply, um, it's kind of like taking a possession when someone defaults under a lease. You change the locks and you say, yeah. Are you, let's make an appointment for you to come on one visit and remove all of your items. So I don't know who these people are. Because no, I understand, but that's no why, that's why I... you want someone at the front door when they turn up. Yeah, so um, I, that was my question. Was one of the questions was about the stuff that they've put in there. Legally, can I dispose of it? What What can I do? My with my, it? my preference would be that you give them the opportunity of taking it. Okay. All right, but you would do that by hiring a security guard. And my view is the house will be worth a few bob, so it's worth spending mm. some money to protect your investment. Yeah. And and then arrange for those items to be removed. But then make up your mind whether you're going to sell the property or tenant it. I am. It. I was Carol. already selling it, but if, my mother... Can I ask you a question? Carol, please stay with yeah. us uh, if you've got more. But if uh, the, the, the squatters improve the property in some they way, do. does that does that so give them any kind of extra There's extra no interest claim? in the property. Okay. None at all. Yeah. Okay. That's so they just something... Added, that... They added a, a, a reverse cycle heater. Yes. And I'm worried that they didn't pay the tradie. Am I then responsible no, for paying? No, you're not responsible for the tradie. Okay. All right. You, the tradie might be um, able to remove it, but that's a different back, question. The answer will be you say to the tradie, you can take it back, but you've got to make good. Ca- Carol, uh, wow. Uh, and what about the belongings of your, your late it's father? Gone. Everything. It, well, it's not just his, it's all mine. Because I've been living there a couple of days every two months, every for 15 odd years. So there was... You know, like not every bedroom had a bed, but there was a, a house, half, three Carol, quarters of the house full of stuff. Carol, gone. you have an action against the person who causes the cause the who who for whom those items were taken by. I'm I'm just trying to recognise that you've got a house worth probably well over half a million dollars. I would be putting my effort into making sure that I got that before I worried about the stuff in the bedroom. Uh, that that would be my approach. Yes, you can sue them, but if they can't afford a house, it's quite likely that they can't afford an action for damages by you either. They can, however, afford a reverse cycle air conditioner. Yep. So my rhetorical question is, who the hell are these people that have just moved in and put in a reverse cycle air conditioner? What what rights do squatters have? Uh, very few. They can acquire them over time. I once had a client who adversely possessed a house in... Um, Hawthorne for upwards of 15 years and acquired title. But I can tell you that the nine weeks since Carol was there won't get them there. <laughs> Carol, uh, I'm sorry to hear all of that, uh, but thank you very much for, for talking to us. I hope that is some help. I'm sure it was. Robin is in Frankston. Hello, Robin. It's a fairly simple question. A baby adopted at birth um, who, as a young adult, discovered his father again and that's um, now gone on so that that person would be in, that boy would be in his 50s now his father is 85 so he's actually more than 50 um does he have any claim on his birth on his father uh, it, on birth certificate or the, anything like that i've had to deal with something like this once in practice um, my view is that if you bring someone into the world you have an obligation to them. But the Adoption Act takes away the legal relationship of parent and child. So from a legal perspective, a child who is adopted out has no relationship that the law recognises between his birth mother and with his birth mother or birth father. 
Now, so that's the short answer to the question. There may be, in a particular set of circumstances, a other factors which change that principle. So, 30 years ago, I was involved in a matter where the, the a birth father had developed a relationship with the child. Um, but in the absence of that, no prospect of recovery whatsoever, unless you want to spend a bucket load of money trying to change the law. Robin, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, quarter past ten. Uh, I'm Justin Smith filling in for RAF this week. Uh, David Whiting is a Melbourne solicitor, and he is our solicitor, and he's sitting right here. And uh, Frank's on the phone from Glen Waverley. Hello, Frank. Uh, hello, uh, Raf. Um, my query is with regard to uh, an incident a week or so ago where I went into one of the major petrol stations to refuel my LPG running car and on every pump there was a sign, we do not accept cash. Now, I don't and never have had a card of any sort, debit or credit card, but I put... $39 worth of LPG in the vehicle. I went into the uh, office to pay. I put $40 on the counter and the woman said, we don't accept cash. And I said, what do you expect me to do? And she said, we need your name and address and you'll have to come back in a week's time, which would be most inconvenient because I was several miles away from home. And uh, you'll have, we, we will accept the cash later on. Now, um, while pondering this and a number of people waving their plastic fantastics behind me, um, there was a Chinese gentleman directly behind me, so I turned to him and said, would you mind using your card if I give you the cash? And he said, certainly, no problem, mate. So that's how we solved it. But have they the right to ask for my name and address? Have they the right to refuse legal tender? And am I liable in any way to just walk away and leave the money on the counter? Frank, m my problem is, is that the Bowser that you went to said, we do not accept cash. Exactly. So they're saying, we are not prepared to do business with people who would like to pay other than with plastic. Right. So, in a sense, you've you've um, ignored it. You've ignored it, and and that's the problem. Right. Now, you could have gone to another service station that offered you uh, the opportunity to pay with real money, which is yeah. plastic too, if you think about it. Yep. So, uh, I, the the difficulty is is that in your particular case, the debt has already arisen. In which stage you can say, well, I'm proposing to discharge the debt with the payment of cash. Yes. Yes. So, Frank, I, I, do, I do, if you don't mind, I have to ask you, otherwise I'll wake up at 2am wondering why I didn't. Why didn't you uh, either go somewhere else or why did you decide to ignore it? Well, it was the cheapest price for the LPG, uh, much cheaper than my local area. Okay. Yes. Frank, th thank you very much. So is, is there any, there's no law there that a... Uh, Someone has to if they if they're a retailer or a service well, station that they have to. Can accept. we split this into a couple sure. of bits? Go ahead. You walk into a supermarket, right, and you, or, or you go to a convenience store, and you pick up some goods and you take them to the counter and you offer cash. At that stage, there's no sale because there's been no offer and acceptance. You've you've made an offer to buy conditional upon paying cash. They're entitled to say, I'm not prepared to sell to you on that basis. So at that stage, there's no contract which has come into existence. But if you walked into a, I don't know, a sandwich shop and you order off the menu and they make the sandwich or you go with a piece of coffee and cake and you take it and you have it and then you go to pay and they now say, but we don't take cash. At that stage, that's their problem because we've had the offer and acceptance, we've bought, we've agreed on the price because it was in the menu. Now, the non-taking of cash is their issue, not yours. But the bit that gets me about Frank's is that Frank says, uh, the, the service station says, we only take customers on this basis. So I'm, I, my view would be, 
Frank's the one who's done the wrong thing, not the retailer. It's uh, 20 past 10, 774 ABC Melbourne. Justin filling in for RAF. We'll come back and we'll have more calls with David Whining in a sec. ABC Sports coverage of the footy finals is in full swing on the ABC Listener. Time to steady and pull the trigger! And we also have a massive summer of sport coming your way. It's gone before. Australia have won. T20 and One Day International Cricket. The BBL and WBBL. The Women's Ashes. Plus, the test series between Australia and India. Unbelievable! Take ABC Sport with you wherever you go with the ABC Listener. app. ABC Radio Melbourne. You're with Justin Smith. And David Whiting is here, Melbourne solicitor and our solicitor. And uh, Nikki is on the phone from Box Hill. Hello, Nikki. Morning, um, Justin. Thanks, David, for taking the call. Now, I've got an owner's corporation voting query. Um, and you mentioned a couple of weeks ago when you were on air about the entitlement and liability for the units in an uh, owner's corporation. And we've got a situation where we've got four units and four garages, but one of the garages is a separate parcel of land, so that's a separate lot. Now, the entitlement for each owner, each of the four owners is 100%. So for the fourth one, it's made up of 95% for the unit and 5% for the garage. Okay, so the total is 400 and Correct. it's split so equally every, between the four owners. Correct. Yes. So every year on our AGM, we've had one vote for each owner. No, There's you what you've... Four well, votes maybe. In total, whereas this year, yep. we've got a new manager in place who's saying that there's now five votes no. Because the garage gets a vote. No. Now, I've pushed back and said that I don't believe is correct. And I've looked up the Owners' Corporation Act and it says one, um, section 91, it says one vote for each lot. However, where does that overlap with the entitlement and liability? Yeah, what you do is you're insisting on a poll, Nikki, and you insist yep. on a poll and you're doing it on the basis of unit entitlement. So you end up with the same number. Okay. Okay, so it's if you on a show of hands, it's one for each lot, but on a on a poll, it's based on unit entitlement. So demand a poll. Nikki, thanks very much for Get calling you in. to your end point. Uh, uh, Frank is in Hoppers Crossing. Hello, Frank. Hello and good morning. Hello, how can we help you, Frank? Yes, David. Um, I've got a forty-three-year-old Down syndrome daughter. I am her VCAT appointed uh, administrator. During the years, I have saved up um, more than $100,000, which are invested in a term deposit. Now, the question is... When you say that, Frank, you've saved up for her and in her name $100,000. Yep. So it's her money, not yours. 100%. Yep. Yes. Now, Mm -hmm. I would like to know, because of her mental impairment, she cannot draw a legal will. What happens when she eventually passes away to that money. Um, Does she not have capacity to make a will? No, she is uh, declared as being mentally incapable. Yeah, but there's a question, there's there's in a sense a couple of levels of incapacity and testamentary capacity is normally assessed slightly differently. If your daughter made with, with, died without a will, her money would go to her parents. Uh, automatic, well, that yep. is subject to she outlives us. Radio. Then, and she has no, clearly has no children or grandchildren? Uh, no. Then no. it would go to, does she have brothers and sisters? Yes, she's got another two siblings. Then they would inherit. So, sorry, it, it, the general proposition is that. It, transferring the uh, funds from uh, her name to her siblings? Um, when she dies, if you give it away before then you'll lose your your job as her administrator. You're not allowed to give away her money, and presumably if you gave her away her money, she might lose her Centrelink benefits as well. Frank, thanks very much for the call. Julie's in Preston. Hello, Julie. Oh, hi there. Um, hi, David, and sorry, I forgot your name. No, it's, it's um, Justin, Julie. Nice to meet you. Justin, hi. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. So my son and daughter-in-law... Um, a renting a room in a registered rooming house in an inner suburb. Um, the lease was um, a 12 month lease expires May next year. Um, it's a very small room, but uh, the big factor in all of this is my daughter in law is now pregnant and expecting a baby in February. And I've um, I've said, look, it's going to be completely unsuitable for the three of you to live in this small room, rooming yes. house. 
and um, they're worried, uh, you know, about breaking leases and and all of that. Said, look, I'm sure of the circumstances. But, but, but Julie, there is a provision in the in the residential tenancies legislation to mm-hmm. make an application to shorten the term of a tenancy agreement. Okay. Now, but why would you not start the negotiations with the landlord about finding somebody else now? Yep, well, that's what I'm encouraging them both so to that, do. So that's what I would be doing. I'd be going to the landlord and simply saying, this isn't going to work for us. We'd like to leave. Yep. Now, and, and so we're encouraging you to go and find someone else. The question, though, Julie, is when do they want to leave? Well, probably tomorrow, but they've got, you know, limit, they're both on Centrelink and they've got limited, you know, private rental capacity on well, the encouragement. Yeah, so, Julie, it's really capacity. a question of looking at what's out there. Yeah. And, and, and so the, you get this transitional kind of issue. What your starting proposition would be, yes, there is a provision at VEEK in the Residential Tenancies Act, but start with a discussion with the owner of the property about this isn't going to work for us. Mm-hmm. Rather than your rental income being upset, can we negotiate an exit strategy now? Yep. Okay, then. Good. Thank you. Julie, thank you very much. Uh, Matt is in Ballarat. Hello, Matt. Oh, good day, Justin. How are you? And David. Um, I've got a, yes, hello. Um, so I've got a, uh, I, I run a, a business advi- a building advisory uh, business, and I have a client who's bought a house and land package in the outskirts of Melbourne. Uh, through a developer, um, so there's two contracts, one with for the land and also for the build. Um, they, they were told it would take three months to title the land. They've been informed it will take another nine months, um, and the client wishes to exit the contracts. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way that they can do that without the prohibitive fines, or not fine, um, fees in which uh, the the landowners and and the developers want to charge them, uh, which are in excess. Matt, it, Matt, it depends upon what the contract says. Yeah. Now, now because they're bought from a developer, there might be some Australian consumer law issues in relation to deceptive and misleading conduct. Mm-hmm. But there will be a provision in the contract for the sale of land, mm-hmm. and I imagine that the building contract is dependent upon the land contract. Yes. So, and it will probably say, um, so for example, I I act for a couple of developers and Mm -hmm. we, the Sale of Land Act says that you can enter into a contract conditional upon registration of a plan and if you don't Mm -hmm. stipulate a time in the contract, you've got 18 months to get the plan registered. Now, um, I see lots of contracts where that period's extended out to two or three years. Mm-hmm. So what you've got to do is read the contract of sale and see what the time limit for plan approval is in the contract and then see how that fits with the representations. So that if there was an express representation in some of the material that the property would be titled in three months, then it may be that there's an argument for deceptive and misleading conduct. There's also another argument that it could be that they've got another nine months to save some more money. Matt, thanks very much for the call. Uh, we haven't exhausted you, have we, David? Can we give you one yeah, last one before we go? Uh, Con is on the phone from Clayton. Uh, go ahead, Con. Uh, hello. Um, hi, David. I've got a query regarding a fence. Um, the rear neighbour has attached uh, and also cement sheeting to the rear fence on their side. Uh, it's a residential property. They've got they've planted ivy. The ivy's growing up the fence coming over. The ivy's also grown onto one of my trees that's near the rear fence. It's pretty much grown all around the tree. It's killed the tree. The trees come down and it's taken, and because the ivy was attached to the fence and the tree, as a tree came down, it pulled the fence down with it. So I, my, I would be saying to your neighbour, you replace the fence at your cost. Uh-huh, because they asked me if I've got insurance. <laughs> no, no, it's not an insurance. Well, it might be an insurance claim in relation to your tree. But your argument would be that everything that occurred because of something that they did without your permission. Okay, but it had it had been growing there for maybe a long time. I hadn't noticed it because it's 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 quite a large. It must be block, a very deep so. block if you haven't noticed the tree and the ivy, 
and the oh, ivy nice was the tree the tree's my tree but the ivy that was growing on it only when I, it came down i cut it i could see it had grown all around the base of the tree and up the tree and there was no tree it was just ivy Sorry, are they, Con, sorry, are they disputing that it's their fault because of the ivy and suggesting it's your fault because it's the tree? Uh, their argument yes. runs like this. The tree pushed the fence over. It's Con's tree. Yeah. That's Con, do you saying. have insurance? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But their ivy is what was attached to the fence. So, Con, how long have you tree. lived there? So, as my tree came down, it Con, pulled the fence down. how long have you lived there? 20-odd uh, years. And, and you think all of this has occurred in the last 20 years? Uh, yes. Okay, then I would be saying to the neighbour, it's your ivy, it's your problem, I'm not making a claim. You fix the fence. Uh, best of luck yeah. with it, Con. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, not an easy fix, I would imagine, but... No, neighbours are a wonderful thing. <laughs> As are you. Thank you, David. Thank you. David Whiting, Melbourne solicitor, will return uh, next week when Raf is back.